Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. Since the 1990s, the so-called broken windows approach to policing has taken hold in a number of cities. The strategy says that the aggressive enforcement of low-level offenses in disadvantaged communities, by keeping those communities more orderly, prevents more serious crimes from occurring. However, a recent study from the CUNY Graduate Center refutes that theory. Instead of making communities safer, it says, it penalizes residents of color, often with lifelong consequences. Here to discuss those findings is Gaurav Jashnani, a researcher at the CUNY Graduate Center and the co-author of that study. Welcome. Thank you. First of all, um, when we talk about um, discretionary arrest, um, you're basically talking about how cops respond to low-level offenses, like, I guess, violations and misdemeanors. Um, what kinds of offenses are we talking about? That's a great question. So some of the offenses we saw most often in the study well, were things like fare evasion, uh, jumping the turnstile on the train, other kinds of uh, transit offenses, things like taking up more than one seat. So uh, someone who gets arrested for having their bag on the seat next to them. Um, also things like uh, possessing a small amount of marijuana in your pocket or having a, an open beer on your front steps or in the park. Cops have a lot of discretion in terms of how they treat people uh, who have committed those offenses. Why did you want to examine the impact of discretionary arrest? So I think there was a couple of reasons that that uh, stood out to us and felt important. Um, one of them was that uh, there has been a lot of attention, particularly I think since the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, but obviously for much longer, um, to the, the most kinds of severe and visible forms of police violence or police misconduct. Um, we see people like Michael Brown and Ferguson, Eric Garner here in New York, uh, George Floyd more recently getting killed or getting murdered by the police. And part of what we had seen uh, talking with community organizations, talking with people who had been impacted by policing, um, was that a lot of police violence was less visible, right? And in fact, that was the bulk of the kinds of mistreatment that people were experiencing from police, things that happened in kind of everyday encounters and the, the legal processes after that. Um, another specific reason was that um, we had been in conversation with some of the groups here in New York City who were trying to reform policing, um, create more accountability for the New York Police Department, and they felt that this area was particularly understudied. And when we looked at the literature, we saw they were absolutely right. Our study, as far as I know, is actually the first study to ever look at these kinds of discretionary arrests. So it's not just cops um, shooting people in the back or putting them in, in, in a chokehold that kills them, but they're all other kinds of police uh, tra treatment of people, low-level offenders, that does great damage to them. That's absolutely right. Uh, all the way from um, attacking someone or physically assaulting them to using racial slurs, denying them food or water when they're in holding, just a whole range of consequences. Let me tell you about an example. This is something that happened to a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a black woman. She's in her late 60s or early 70s. And she lived on the west side. And one day, uh, I guess she was particularly upset about something that Donald, Tr Donald, Donald Trump had done. Mm -hmm. She went out of her house, and there was an abandoned building across the street. Uh, not, it was boarded up, mm -hmm. boarded up. And she had a piece of chalk in her hand. And she wrote something like, I don't know, Trump sucks or whatever mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, with Cran. There happened to be a couple of rookie cops across the street who saw this. They went over and, I guess, confronted her, and they wound up arresting her, taking her into custody for a number of hours. Uh, I don't know if she had to, I don't, I don't think she had to be bailed out, but her husband had to come and get her. Mm -hmm. And um, the question is, how could that have been handled? <laughs> the, the, the cops chose to arrest her for that. There are other ways that that could have been handled, correct? That's absolutely right. So. Uh, I think there's a few ways to think about it. One is that chalk is typically washable and that shouldn't be considered an offense. It's not lasting property damage. If the charge was trespassing, then that's exactly one of those kinds of situations we were talking about where by law, the officer has discretion over whether to arrest this person, take them in, hold them for up to 24 hours, um, or just write them a ticket and send them home. 
right? And um, what we saw was that disproportionately police were choosing to arrest and take in people who were black, people who were Latinx, people who were homeless in New York City. Or they could have just said, ma'am, this is not a good thing to do. Uh, don't let us see you doing this again. Go home. If we see you again, you know, there might be consequences. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think uh, we all think of that as a common sense idea of discretion, and it's true, and we see it all the time. Um, and part of what a lot of the study participants talked about was seeing um, most of our study participants were black or Latinx New Yorkers, and uh, multiple people talked about seeing white people uh, do similar things to what they had been arrested for uh, without any consequences, including even when people were together in the same situation. Uh, we interviewed one, for example, one white participant who was describing an arrest that he had experienced, but also talking about another situation where him and a black friend were having a drink. His black friend gets arrested. He's just let go to go on home. Right, and that kind of discrepancy was part of what really stood out in our research. So the options are for low-level offenses, I mean, it could be a reprimand, it can be a ticket. Can there also be a, uh, some cases where a summons is issued? So uh, a summons in New York City is, is typically what's given instead of a ticket or what's called a ticket other places, uh, but it requires an appearance in court. There's only, a, I believe, a small number of offenses where you just might get a ticket that you could mail in and pay for, right. for example, for public drinking. And, and the white summons is more consequential because if you don't, if you don't show up for the summons, then what, what, could, what can happen to you? Yeah, so uh, I'm so glad you asked that because what we saw is this kind of cascade effect at times. So um, there was a, a young person who I interviewed for this research who had a situation a little bit similar to your friends, um, except that she was in her own apartment building. She was on the roof of her building, hanging out with a friend, her and her friend come down from the stairs, down from the roof, and suddenly there's cops running up to them, guns drawn, pointed at them, saying that they're trespassing. Um, and so what we saw uh, ultimately is that this person uh, experienced a lot of negative impacts from this, in part because she ended up being sexually assaulted by one of the officers arresting her. Um, but it was all prolonged by the fact that she had a warrant from a previous experience where her offense was being in a park that she walked through after dark when it was technically closed. So that led to her being held for much longer and being vulnerable to kind of more violence by that person who assaulted her. So it's this accumulation of low level, you know, offenses. Absolutely. We spoke with people who had been stopped by police uh, as many as 80 or even 100 times and been uh, arrested numerous times for these low level kind of offenses. How did you go about doing your research? Uh, so we really tried to start by looking at the literature and then talking with some of these community organizations to understand their kind of expertise on the ground to get a better sense of the situation and understand some of the consequences that we might not intuitively think about. For example, uh, we worked with a, an organization that um, advocates for the rights of homeless New Yorkers and they gave us a better sense of some of the experience that uh, uh, people that they worked with were having with police. And so, for example, it didn't occur, occur to me before that that a large number of people might actually lose their bed in a shelter and be out on the street uh, because they were arrested for getting on the bus without paying the fare in order to get to the shelter, things like that. Um, once we had the kind of basics, we designed uh, an interview protocol and a survey and just um, the bulk of the people we spoke with, we surveyed and we went to the main criminal courthouses in every borough of New York City and just set up shop outside the courthouse, talked to everyone who came out uh, and discussed uh, recent arrests for whoever was there for a hearing, whoever had recently experienced one of these discretionary arrests. And you had, what, about 110 people that you actually Yeah, interviewed? so we surveyed about 110 people and then spoke with nearly 100 other people through these interviews, through focus groups, and through other kinds of engagement. You talked about immediate consequences. What are some of the immediate consequences? So some of the immediate consequences would be um, things like uh, getting handcuffed very tightly and being in extreme pain. Some of the people we interviewed or surveyed had numbness or severe pain for up to several weeks after their arrest. Uh, also, things that we categorized as physical abuse, whether that be uh, actually getting hit or physically assaulted by police, um, being denied food, water, bathroom access, some people we interviewed and surveyed um, were denied medical attention or prescription medication for heart conditions, asthma, 
Some people were actually forced to get unwanted medical attention. One person I interviewed ended up with a 600 something dollar medical bill for an asthma inhaler she was forced to get because the, the officers told her otherwise they wouldn't process her and let her get out. Um, and then that also, the immediate consequences also included these kinds of verbal assaults, being called racial slurs or misogynist terms, um, things like that. And then you have to appear in court, correct? Right, also, right, this incredible loss of time. So I think the average was about 31 hours that each person arrested was held. So more than a day of their life that they lost for, let's say, walking from one train car to another, right? And then after that comes going to court. Some people had to go to court multiple times. I think more than a third of the people had to go to court two, three, five times to deal with these petty offenses and arrests. Uh, also things like educational consequences or employment consequences. A number of people we spoke with also lost their jobs because they're in the police precinct, they're in jail, right. their phone gets confiscated, they can't call their boss to even say what's happening. And um, housing consequences, you, you mentioned, you, right. might, you, you can possibly lose your Right, your shelter, your it can have ramifications if you're in public housing, depending on what you're being arrested for, um, or a lot of people suffered a loss of income, uh, financial losses from fines that they were required to pay, um, or having cell phones that were damaged or cash that disappeared when they were arrested. So I think around one out of every eight people that we surveyed actually uh, had serious housing consequences as a result of their arrest. And then there are what, what you talked about as cumulative consequences yeah. of these kinds of, uh, this kind of, I will call it harassment. Right, so we found it very helpful to, in part, talk with each survey participant about what was that specific most recent arrest like? What did you experience? What did you go through? And then also to talk about cumulatively all the previous arrests that they had had for these discretionary offenses, right? And what we found was that it was really important to look at that one arrest as a unit to see what was happening, but that you couldn't understand that without the broader context to see how they had been impacted over time and how it added up. Um, to something greater than the sum of its parts. You are a psychologist. Um, what's the impact on the psychology of the people in these communities that it happens to? So I think that's such an important question in part as a psychologist and in part um, as a community member seeing that mental health is such a pervasive problem in our country with minimal supports, right? And as a person who's been targeted by police, particularly when I was younger, Right, what we found in our study, this recent article that we published was focused on what we're talking about now, these material impacts. But we've also published another paper from these findings um, really focused on more of the psychological consequences. And what we saw was so many people were coming away with symptoms of post-traumatic stress, symptoms of depression, feeling anxious. Numerous people we talked to said, when I see police on the street now, I freeze, I get scared, I worry that they're gonna stop me for no reason. Uh, people withdrew from public space. They were scared to go to school. They missed weeks of school. Uh, they would cross the street or take the long way to get to work so that they wouldn't have to go by the street where all the police camp out because maybe that's where the school is or that's where the subway is, right? Um, so people were really seriously psychologically impacted and I think in part because these were disproportionately lower income communities being targeted, people had really few kinds of recourses in terms of getting treatment, in terms of getting support for the impacts that they faced. I believe that 90% of the people that you uh, talked to were black or Latino, is that correct? That's absolutely right, right? And it's just further evidence building on many previous studies that it's disproportionately black and Latinx communities in New York who are targeted by police. Why? So I think there's, there's a few competing theories around this. One of them says that, you know, it's racism that when we look at the history of policing, we see racial targeting since the inception of police departments of these kinds of institutions, and that's continued over time. You know, there's another theory that says, well, a lot of this is about uh, you know, kind of disciplining people who are unemployed, who are lower income, who are seen as the dangerous classes. That's the term that we see in some of the older literature. Uh, people who are inherently criminal, who have these kinds of antisocial tendencies. Deviant. Deviant, exactly. So this is a if you look at the history of criminology, there's a lot of racialized perspectives and language where black people and Latinx people and sometimes Native American people are seen as dangerous, as deviant, as more likely to be criminals. How many, do we know how many 
uh, of these kinds of low level of rest, of arrests of low income black and Latino people happen in New York in, a, in the course of a year? So the number has been changing a lot. I would say, I think it's important to know that when we conducted the research was the beginning of the de Blasio, was during the first de Blasio administration and numbers were in the process of going down. Uh, we saw the real height of it during the Bloomberg administration. Um, and even with the significant decrease, there are still uh, thousands and thousands of these discretionary arrests every year with people spending sometimes multiple days in lockup for, again, for having marijuana in their pocket. That marijuana offense, of course, that's changed now right. with recent legalization. Um, but uh, people still carry the stigma and the consequences of those arrests. So one of the things we talk about in the paper is that um, this also has had huge impacts for people around finding a job, right? And the long-term consequences of unemployment can be really catastrophic financially. You know, often it just sort of criminalizes people who exactly. were not in the criminal justice system before. Right, and, and what we know from, from uh, sociological research is that, particularly for black people with a criminal record, it is much harder to find a job. Employers are much more likely to discriminate against them than with a white person with a similar record. Right, there's been studies that found that even a black person with no criminal record is about as likely to get a job as a white person with, with a, criminal a criminal record. record. Is there any evidence that this kind of aggressive policing of low-level offenses actually reduces serious crime? Because that, that is a, this is the theory that is based on. So I would say that claim has been made with minimal evidence. And what we see from a number of scholars, including uh, CUNY's own Andrew Carmen, has written a famous book about this. There was a, a massive study about four years ago from the National Academy of Sciences. And what these studies have found is that, number one, there is minimal success in the stated goals of broken windows policing. And those goals are primarily reducing felonies or serious crime and reducing overall crime. So typically, uh, broken windows is not successful at that. It's also extremely cost ineffective. It's a huge use of resources. In New York City, an enormous amount of money. Uh, the estimates are over $2,000 per person go into um, arresting someone and just holding them for one day for these How much? minimal. Over $2,000 per person. Um, and uh, what we've also seen is that there's frequent violations of Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights, particularly the Equal Protections Clause. There has been pushback against this kind of policing. It's hard for me to figure out whether there, there's pushback and then there are people pushing back against the pushback. Um, I, in, in 2016, the city council voted to decriminalize certain offenses, um, required cops to give tickets instead of summonses for littering, noise violations, public urination, open alcohol containers, breaking park rules. Uh, four of the city's five district attorneys said they were gonna to refuse to prosecute misdemeanor cases involving marijuana and small amounts of cocaine. And at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, a coalition of advocacy organizations called on Mayor de Blasio to suspend all policing of low-level broken window type offenses. But then Mayor Eric Adams comes in and seems to say, well, he seems to defend cracking down on low-level offenses. So where are we now? Where does it stand yeah. now? So there's, I think, two things that I, that I think are really important to know about this. Number one is a lot of these previous efforts under de Blasio uh, to kind of lower the, the reaction to these low-level offenses. A lot of it was concentrated in Manhattan, and a lot of it didn't actually eliminate discretion. It, uh, there was a lot of language around prioritizing the summons or the ticket, right, but still leaving open the option of an arrest for some of these offenses, right? And so what we've seen time and time again is as long as there's discretion, it's used inequitably, particularly around race and around class and around and against really targeting people who don't have a home to go to. Um, as far as where we are in this moment, Eric Adams is a very strange figure in this story. Um, as you know, right, he is famous in part for being a police officer who stood up to what he saw as unjust policing. He co-founded this organization, 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement. Um, he said that he was targeted by, by the NYPD quite violently for standing up to some of the practices that they had. He famously testified in the stop and frisk trial here in New York City um, that found stop and frisk to be unconstitutional. So he was really seen, I think, in that moment as a little bit, almost a hero in challenging race, racialized policing here. And then in this campaign, we see him coming out hard again 
uh, for broken windows, for quality of life, or broken windows policing, whatever you want to call it. And he's now really allied himself in some ways with the NYPD. Your study suggests that aggressive order, order maintenance policing does more harm than good. So what kinds of alternatives does your research re support? So I think there's a lot of research on that. And part of what we felt that was important to do in our work uh, is something that doesn't happen often enough in criminological research or this kind of psychological research, which is really look at the people at the center of the issue and see what they think, what they've learned, and what their communities have learned from the policing, from the problems in their communities that they think are the root causes of these issues. So in this recent article, uh, I felt very lucky that we could actually incorporate these really often powerful visions that some of the participants had about what they think should be happening instead. So some of the participants talked about <clears throat> what they saw as the root causes of these issues, things like uh, poverty, gentrification, and how gentrification uh, really was undermining the fabric of their communities and the ways that people could support each other and hold each other accountable without the police. Um, and just the broader uh, austerity and unwillingness to fund the things that communities need. So people said, people who had been arrested, who had been harmed by police said, we need to actually spend less money on police and jails and money on the things that we need to be safe and to take care of each other, things like housing, education, uh, public space. Uh, participants talked about the importance of uh, actually holding police accountable for things like putting people in chokeholds. That's been a very contentious issue here and across the country. Should people actually, should police actually face consequences when they break the law or break department policy? And unfortunately, the answer is usually no in practice, right? And they also talked about um, how it might be much more effective to have more unarmed patrols to shift toward more crisis response or mental health teams that weren't attached to the police that weren't just a wing of the same kind of punitive response. Um, but, but also that, that poverty is a bigger factor in leading to serious and more violent crimes than whether people are um, smoking pot on the street or urinating in the park, you know, urinating in public or even causing public disturbances, that poverty is a real driver. Absolutely. You know, there was one participant who we interviewed who, who had actually been arrested. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about these kinds of, uh, what I think of colloquially as these kinds of ridiculous arrests. People often talked about arrests where they felt like what was happening was misrepresented or even fabricated. So this young man was arrested for marijuana possession when the, the marijuana wasn't on his person. It was several yards away. Um, and he talked about, um, you know, I think... I think the way he said it was that people don't decide, oh, I'm just going to go shoot someone. That's not how crime works. People commit crime because they don't have what they need to live, what they need to survive, right? And I think that's what we see over and over. Um, there's so many survival crimes, crimes where people are looking for money or are looking uh, for resources or they're suffering, right? There's mental health issues that are unattended. Um, there's conflicts that they don't have other means to deal with. So what do you want to be the result of this study? What do you want its impact to be? Hmm. So number one, I want people to know that this kind of low-level policing creates more problems than it solves. And it's not enforced equitably. And when it is enforced, people suffer in ways that have no relationship to and are not proportionate to the things that they're being arrested for. Someone loses their job because they drank a beer on their own front steps, right? Someone um, has delays in their immigration process or loses their house, right, loses their apartment because they, um, just to use one specific example from our study, because they were standing on the stairs of their train station waiting for their friend and got arrested for trespassing, right? And I think another impact that this study will ideally have is to communicate to lawmakers that there should not be this kind of discretion. As long as there's discretion, there will be abuse and inequity in how it's implemented. And these kinds of low-level offenses are not a danger to the city or to its residents, and they should only be enforced, if at all, with a summons rather than arrest. Do you see, I mean, we see the city going back and forth in different mm -hmm. directions. Do you see the city at all moving in that direction, or we don't know? 
you know, I think that it felt like it was moving in that direction before the pandemic. I think the pandemic has changed a lot of things, including a feeling of safety and public safety. There's obviously been an uptick in gun violence in the city, which is very concerning. Uh, a lot of people have been impacted, right? And part of what we found with uh, another wing of this kind of low level enforcement and harassment of communities of color with stop and frisk. When stop and frisk was at its peak in New York City under Bloomberg, over and over what we saw is almost no one who was stopped and frisked had a gun, a knife, or any other kind of weapon. Right. It was basically a way of harassing people and chasing them out of public space, right? And I think the lesson is that safety has to come uh, from community building, from resources, and that police don't build community. They can't, it's not their job. I mean, it seems like a complicated issue, but maybe not so complicated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank Garab Jashnani, co-author of Legal Process as Racialized Punishment, The Material Consequences of Discretionary Arrests in New York City, for joining me today. To learn about our upcoming shows, you can follow us on Twitter at one to one CUNY TV. For the City University of New York and one to one I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Yeah.